Hello, welcome to my video sample for my presentation on the topic of conflicts of interest. Conflicts of interest are a very common thing in business and frankly life in general, and they're oftentimes something economists refer to as the principal agent problem. And that's typically where a principal hires someone else to act on their behalf, called the agent, and oftentimes that's to perform a service or maybe it's to uh, procure products and services from a third party. And so there, it's fraught with conflicts of interest where the agent's interests are either in contradiction to the principal's interest or even if they're imperfectly aligned with the principals. And so I want to make everybody aware of the, of the concepts of, of how these exist and I have several examples of how they're implemented. Now it's interesting to note that the the word agent is also drawn from the word agenda. They're both from the Latin meaning uh, agenda meaning things to be done. And it's kind of interesting to me that agenda has taken on a connotation of having a ulterior motives because that's particularly fitting in this discussion where our agent is potentially has ulterior motives. That's sort of a happy accident of etymology. But anyway, this presentation is relevant to just about anyone. I mean, a lot of us, even if it's not in our professional life, we might have lawyers or financial advisors. So we, it, these are really common and, there's, and the, they're fr the, our lives are fraught with all sorts of subtle conflicts of interest and this should help the audience understand them. It's particularly helpful to managers and business owners. It's probably geared a little bit towards business as is much of my work, but it applies to a much broader swath of people, including any anybody responsible for hiring someone to act on their behalf, which might include nonprofits or, or government agencies. It's also another one of my presentations that's multidisciplinary. It's not specific to finance or marketing. It, it draws from all business experiences. It's kind of a general high level uh, co discussion of, of a particular concept, conflicts of interest. So with that preface, let's get going with some of my examples. The first one I want to talk to, and I have the most, sam most of my sample from this, is the relationship between employer and employee. If, if the employee doesn't have interests that are perfectly aligned with the employer, that can create conflicts of interest. And the first example of that is I, I have is what I call growing the pie versus splitting the pie. As a business, you and your employees want to increase the business, the profits of that business, and you're aligned in that. But when it comes to splitting them between the ownership and the salaries, the pay of the employees, those interests can become misaligned. And I once had an experience where I worked for someone who was very keen on trying to get me to think about how we're all on the same team, we're doing something special here, we're growing the pie, we're building something great, but he was always hesitant to split it. That was actually a little bit of a reverse from this issue in that he, uh, uh, the agent was being taken advantage of because of the principal. At least that was my view as the agent, the employee in this case. So needless to say, that didn't last long, but it's important to remember that while you are also, your, your employees are there to help you grow the business, they're also competing for the value of the business as well in terms of what you pay them. And I'm not necessarily thinking that's the only way you should think of your employees as competition, but it, it is important to bear in mind. The second example I want to talk about is information sharing. This is basically where the employer wants to maintain information in the best interests uh, and information security in the best interests of the firm, but the employee might be able to advance their personal position by sharing it more broadly. A good example of this is um, they might change jobs by going to work for a competitor and their information of the business itself might be of great value to the other competitor and the ramification there is if you're the employer you want to pay them uh, it, it, you, your pay for them might be increased not just based on the value of their work but based on the value that, that they could they could deprive the business of if they go to a competitor also uh, a particularly shady example I knew a guy who used to he was a beer distributor and he used to he used to bribe all of his competitors employees to get them to share their information so he could always tell how he was doing in the market relative to the internal information of his Im 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 uh, competitors. I'm not recommending that course of action, by the way. The other issue that you have is redundancy. This is where, in a, as an employer, you want to always have someone else who can do the job if that employee, as we discussed, decides to leave the firm. 
However, it's not necessarily in that employee's best interest. The employee is interested in cultivating a dependency on them so they can extract, so they can have greater job security and extract more value through pay. Now that's not always the case because if they're particularly ambitious employees, they don't want to become too important in one position because it will prevent them from moving on to the next one. But if they're settled in a position, they're not interested in being made redundant, whereas the employer will always want at least one other person who knows how, to, how they do their job and use their computer system, their software, um, whatever that happens to be. So there's, an, there's another issue where there's a bit of a conflict. The next one I want to talk about is if you're paying your employees, you will oftentimes, uh, of course you are, you will be also giving them experience. And one of the questions is who gets the value of that experience. This is kind of a very personalized version of a growing the pie versus splitting the pie. Here I talked about growing the pie being the business profit pool and splitting it being salary. This is more about the value of that experience. It enhances the value of an individual employee, but the split based on the pay is determines how much of the value of that experience accrues to the employer versus the employee. And so oftentimes you'll end up having to give your employees merit increases to quantify and reward them for the value of that experience. And the last one I want to talk about with the employer-employee relationship is you run into a conflict of interest when it's easier for the employee to manage up the employer than it is to actually do a better job. This is a, a, a classic example of uh, if doing a good job is hard, but it's easier to convince your boss that that's the best job you can do, you will end up doing just playing a political game, managing up, convincing your boss that that's the best you can do, and that's clearly not in the industry's uh, pardon me, the firm's best interest. And you can do that by managing expectations, uh, telling them that this is hard. Another good example of that is sort of sandbagging, making it seem like uh, this is the best you can do. Another example of that is oftentimes if you have a sales force or someone based on a commission sales or a bonus sales, and there's an opportunity for them to game that sales system. For example, if I'm a sales rep and I know that I've already hit my quota for this month uh, or this quarter, I can go to my customer and say, look, I know you need some more equipment, but let's wait till next quarter so I can get credit for it. Now that's in my interest as the sales rep, that's not necessarily in the firm's interest. So that's another conflict of interest. So that's employer-employee. Let's take a couple other quick examples. I like to talk about investment bankers, and I want to be clear here, I'm talking about deals uh, like mergers and acquisitions when I talk about bankers. I'm not talking about financial advisors, I'll get to them momentarily, but let's talk about when you're doing a deal with an investment bank, like you're looking at buying a company or uh, selling your company, it's important to note that um, the investment bankers are typically compensated based on a percentage of the deal or the deal going through. And this creates a conflict of interest when the bankers when the, when, the, when the bankers themselves are doing the due diligence. Generally speaking, you don't want your bankers doing all of your due diligence. You want someone on your own staff. Typically, they'll volunteer to do it. They're happy to do it for you as part of their fees. But remember, they are going to make a deal look more optimistic than it actually is because that's their incentive. They don't necessarily get paid as much if, if it's a bad deal, so they're not going to come to you and tell you not to do a bad deal. Now, hopefully, they wouldn't out and out lie to you, although if you've read the Wall Street Journal over the last any period, you'll notice they're not too proud to do that. That does happen, but even if giving them the benefit of the doubt, they're not doing anything explicitly dishonest, they will oftentimes interpret ambiguity in the most optimistic way, or if there's a risk, they will look for reasons to diminish it. They will sort of use a certain selectivity bias when, when processing that information and bringing it to you. Another example of this is when companies go public. They might have an initial public offering and typically the bank says, I got great news for you as the company, I'm going to underwrite that. That means I will find enough people to buy the initial shares at our set price. So you won't have to worry about that. But what they oftentimes do is they sandbag the price so that when the private clients buy into it, the private clients get a big boost in their, uh, in their portfolio and they, the private clients tend to profit from this. So that increases the private client's loyalty to that bank. So what they're essentially doing is they're using the value, they're sandbagging the value of the money that you're going to raise through your IPO to essentially bribe other clients into loyalty to their firm. And it's interesting that they sort of present that, oh, we're going to underwrite it, we're going to set it all up for you as a favor, but in reality, they also have a 
conflict of interest because they want to make sure that the price goes up more for the private clients. And it's important to remember, if you watch the news about an IPO, let's say the IPO price is 20 and it goes up to 30 the first day of trading, everybody says, great, well, that's great for these guys because they were the ones who bought in at 20 and they experienced the upside. But if you're the company, it's important to remember you're raising capital and essentially they underpriced it at only 20, you could have sold those shares for 30. Let's use another example. Uh, moving on from investment bankers, this is what I call here booking agents. I, sort of a general term I'm looking for. This could be a talent agent. This could be a literary agent. A lot of different types of agents. But uh, let's use a talent agent as an example here. Um, one of the problems, one of the conflicts of interest you have with your agent is that they have other clients. And that might mean that their interests aren't perfectly aligned with yours. I'll use the example of the comedian Sarah Silverman. She told a story of when she was a, a young up-and-coming comic in LA, she used to hang out with a lot of writers for some of the television scripts. And some of them said, hey, I got a great idea. Let's, we'll write a part for you because they wanted to help out their friend. And when the producers of the show called Sarah Silverman's agents to tell them that they, to ask, said, you know, we have a, a part in mind for her. The agent said, not knowing that this part had been written for Sarah by her friends, said, well, what's the part? I got plenty of girls. So the point is, Sarah was only interested. Sarah was specifically interested in this part coming to her, but her agent was fine with it going to any of her clients. So he wanted to shop the role with all of his clients to get the perfect fit because he's just interested in getting one of his clients to have it. So that's a, an interesting example of a conflict of interest there. An, uh, another example of the conflict of interest, which sort of falls between these two, I'll use another comedian's example. Adam Carolla talks about how he used publicists, not technically an agent, but when you go on a television show, like a talk show, like a Leno or something, the order of the guests usually descends in order of uh, importance, fame, and, and it's generally perceived to be more prestigious and better for your business if you're on earlier in the show. So the publicists all jockey saying, look, I'm not going to have them on the show unless they're first or second, something like that. Now, Adam Carolla's attitude is, look, I would be fine with any of these agents. Uh, I would be fine with letting the show themselves choose. I'm not trying to promote myself that aggressively. I'm not interested in sharking anyone else. But if others have their agents, their publicists acting on their behalf, he will always end up being last on the show. So he has to sort of a race to the bottom. He has to hire a publicist to, 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 to fight that fight for him. And so there's another example of how the, uh, and, and so clearly the publicists matter. Another way in which that can become a conflict of interest is if your publicist has other clients, they can end up saying, look, I will, and they have like a famous client and a secondarily famous, not so famous client. They'll say, look, I'm only going to give you my famous client if you put my secondary famous client on as well. Now that's good if you're the secondary famous client because you're essentially being able to ride on the famous client's coattails. But it's bad if you're the famous client because even if it doesn't hurt you, there's, it's, it's an opportunity cost. Here's a value of your fame that is accruing to someone else. So you're essentially, someone else is free riding off your coattails and theoretically you should get something for that, but you usually don't, the agent does. And that brings me to my last point. Well, it's easy to say if they have other clients, then I want them to only have me as a client. Well, there's actually a trade-off involved. And that, I call that trade-off the difference between being connected and being dedicated. So if you want them to only have you as a client, you can, but the only agents who will have you as their only client are typically the least connected. If they're connected, they can use those connections for multiple clients and they will have already had other clients. So it's kind of like uh, you can have to be the, the, the jack of all trades versus the, the master of one. You can have them uh, acting only on your behalf, but then they might not be as connected or the connected ones that are gonna get you the most gigs are gonna be sharing them among their other clients. It's also possible to say, well, I'm rich and famous and I can have them work only for me, but then you're gonna end up paying them a lot. And what you're implicitly saying there is the, the value that the dedication accrues to me it exceeds the premium that I would have to pay them. And that's something you would have to consider. So let's go to my last example. I call this who's the boss. Now this is kind of a, of a high level uh, general concept that applies to a lot of people. I'm gonna talk about three here in particular, but the idea is this. In theory, the principal hires the agent to work on the principal's behalf. Now, now, what we've been talking about so far of conflict of interest is typically where the agent, in fact, works for themselves. 
but here's the most advances their own interest. But here's a subtle point. Sometimes if they're between the principal and the third party, and I'll give you some examples momentarily, they're actually better off deferring to the interests of the third party than the principal. In other words, even if they're looking after themselves, they themselves will be more enriched through loyalty to the third party than the principal. And there are several examples of this. The first one I'll use is the financial advisor. So you're an individual investor and you hire a financial advisor. Oftentimes, you are one of many, uh, many clients of the financial advisor and they are oftentimes paid essentially kickbacks. They don't call it that. That's a perfectly legal thing, but from the fund companies and the asset managers, they not only charge you know commissions and th these guys will charge commissions to their investors and the asset managers will charge fees to the investors, but oftentimes these guys will pay these guys a essentially a kickback to be promoted as uh, to these guys. And these guys can make more money playing uh, off of these guys than they can off the commissions to their uh, investors. Another good example of this is a sort of a shady telecom consultant I did a deal with once. He would, uh, what he did is he went to real estate developers and told them he can help them develop their telecom infrastructure and uh, he can make them a little bit more money off them, uh, make more money for them versus them just going directly to the cable company or the telephone company and having them do it on their own. Now that was true except for the fact that because his, he had numerous developers, but he always did business with the same third parties, the suppliers, he was actually getting kickbacks from the suppliers to recommend them. And the nuance here is, if you'll notice, these guys in this case, uh, really either case, the, con the telecom consultant or the financial advisor, they're hiring this agent in theory because the agent knows better. But much like back here when I talked about it's easier to manage the employer than do the better job, Oftentimes, it's easier to take advantage of their lack of knowledge, the principal's lack of knowledge, than it is to get the best deal out of the third party because these are a much more knowledgeable party. So they end up just getting in bed with the third parties and managing the, uh, man and making their money off of the lack of awareness of the principal. The last example that I want to use is what I call, this is actually a common term called regulatory capture. It's when the government, uh, which will be represented as our principals, theoretically representing the people, hires a regulator, an agency like you know the Department of Commerce, whatever it happens to be, to go out and regulate some industry. So the oil and gas industry might be regulated by the EPA or the Department of, uh, of Minerals. Um, I, don't, I don't know all the agencies there, but the problem here is they will do the same thing. They will quickly realize the public and oftentimes even the politicians as their proxy don't understand much about this but the third parties the oil and gas companies understand this really well so they become captive to these guys these guys will start taking them out to fancy dinners and golf trips and it's very hard to get them to do something different because they know all the tricks whereas these guys don't so they end up managing this way instead of that way so that's a sample of my conflicts of interest presentation I have several more examples in my live presentation I hope you found this of interest. If so, please contact me for a proposal. I look forward to doing business with you. Thank you.